Greetings. Welcome to Bill's Garden. Um, today, I want to engage in one of those just rambling discourses. Um, this one is about uh, organic living in a technological society. Humans, humans are really, really good at building tools. Uh, of all creatures on the planet, we are the number one tool builder. And so there are other intelligent creatures on this planet. Um, I think we have probably just two things going for us as an organism that makes us special here, if we are special, um, and that would be that we tend to be self-aware. That's can't tell you for sure whether a frog or a bird is self-aware, but the other thing that's special about us is we are definitely the number one tool builder here. Uh, nobody makes better tools than we do. We are organic creatures, though. I mean, humans are part of the environment just as much as dragonflies or oak trees or anything else. There is no separation there other than in our psyche. A lot of us don't feel that we're part of the environment. We talk about the environment as if it's something separate or nature as if it's something external. That is not true. You are part of nature. You are part of the environment and the only reason you might be having problems with that is because humans uh, tend, tend to live in their heads. Yeah, we see the world through our own images of what's going on out there rather than connecting to the greater reality at large most of the time. Uh, most, especially when you're urbanized, urban dwellers, you know, living up somewhere uh, in a skyscraper supported by all this infrastructure and electrical wiring and, and pipes and sewers and blah, blah, blah. You, you have isolated yourself so far away from the earth that you're almost like living in a space station. It's close. Most of us have lost that intimate contact with this planet. Um, and so it makes organic living very, very, very difficult. What I say organic living, to define that, that's basically what I mean is that uh, human beings at one time lived in a way that was just kind of a cut above the way the bears and the timber wolves do, you know. We lived right here on the planet, eating what was on the planet in front of us and so on. Um, you know, gathering our water from the stream or from the sky, uh, eating whatever plants were in the environment and so on. Uh, it was clear that we were definitely part of the natural world. Uh, of course, you know, sometimes it didn't provide everything we wanted. There wasn't a shelter when it was cold or wet or whatever. So being such great tool builders, we started to create all sorts of things like edifice to live in, you know. We built houses. We built roads to walk on so we have to walk in the mud you know and that kind of stuff we began to change the face of the planet to such an extent that a lot of it really doesn't appear to be natural at all anymore there's large portions of this planet that are now completely technological and uh, because our tool building skills are so awesome as a species that today our tools are getting to the point where they may begin to take us over rather than us controlling the tool. When the most sophisticated tool we had was, you know, a hatchet or a bow and arrow or something on that order, a shovel, you know. Um, well, these tools were pretty easy to control. Uh, you know, the bow and arrow generally only killed what it was aimed at and so on. Um, but as time moved forward and we get into the 20th century, we became so technological. We invented the internet. Um, we invented the computer, you know. Now and then we invented the smartphone. And now what's happening to us is that we've become so immersed in our technology that we're losing our biology. It's, I mean, we're still organic. But most of us don't realize this anymore. You know, we see uh, life as having to be sustained by supermarkets, by freeways, you know, by all this infrastructure and so on. Cannot visualize living outside of that. Well, you know, I attest to the fact that I kind of live with a foot in both worlds. I mean, I wouldn't be in front of a video camera right now, and I wouldn't sit down and edit this video and post it on the Internet, you know, and spread it across the planet if I wasn't also part of the technological culture. Uh, the tools that we once had 
were tools that were totally within our control and we drove the tools. As we entered the 20th century and tools became more and more and more sophisticated till we get into the, the age where we have internets, we have digital communication, we have the smartphones and so on, um, we tend to spend a lot more time with our technology and living in a technological way than we ever spent in an organic way. You know, some of us go camping, hey, you know, or something like that. We've got to kind of pretend that we're still part of the natural world, but by and large, we really cut ourselves off from it. Even the food that most of us eat, most of it is not wild harvested anymore. You know, fish populations are in serious decline. The fish are being farmed, the cattle being farmed. We don't chase down water buffaloes or anything anymore with a spear, you know. Uh, Anyway, so as I said, I have tended to live with my feet in both worlds here because, uh, well, I tend to appreciate both aspects of being human. I love the organic aspect and I do raise most of my own food right here on the ground where I live. You know, we get our energy and our hot water here right straight from the sun. Uh, and so I'm using a lot of the natural energy of this planet and using nature a lot here in my daily life. Now I am using it involved with technology. You know, I love having a hot shower. Hey, it's great. You know, so I get solar collectors on the roof over here and, and tanks and pumps and all kinds of junk that's technological. But basically we're using the sun's energy to give me a warm shower. So kind of a hybrid situation here, you know, it's natural energy combined with technological energy and it's in a way that's very clear for me to see and know. When the sun goes behind a cloud and it's been there for a week and I try to take a hot shower, it doesn't shower so hot! I'm definitely in touch with the sun, you know, when the sun's been up strong all day long, I gotta shower in there and take your skin right off and uh, so I know. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we pay attention to which way the wind blows around here and so on. Uh, you know, it's my point to get up every morning and to watch the sun come up uh, along the edge of the earth over here and rise. I, I do that every day. Um, why? Well, I track the seasons. I can always tell what time of year it is by where the sun's coming up. Makes me feel uh, I have orientation. Um, so. I'd like to pick on a single aspect of our technology here uh, to make this argument, and it is the smartphone. Okay, I personally have no use for this appliance. Uh, there may come a time, because of what happens around me, that I will have to adopt the appliance and I'll have to use it. I was the same way with a computer. You know, I did all my drafting by hand, I did all my film with actual film uh, instead of digital, you know, I did all my musical recording with recording tape, you know, and well, as time moved on, that was impossible, you just didn't keep that up, and so I had to switch and draft the computer, you know, uh, do vi digital recordings, uh, both in music and in video, and then edit it digitally using computers. And you know, so I understand the technology to a point. All right, it, as much of it as I have to use, I see these things as tools, though, in the classic sense of the same thing as a shovel or a hammer or anything else. Um, in other words, I uh, I don't uh, obsess about the technology. Okay. Uh, I use it, but as far as do I like spending time in front of my computer screen? Hell no! <laughs> There's no way you could get me, especially when you make it this big and you call it a smartphone, you know, and I'm supposed to be staring at it like this. You know, man, I can't even see my face in the mirror in the morning when I get up. Try to look at one of them screens. That's got to be the most inconvenient piece of technology anybody has ever thought of, and it's on the way out already. I mean, the smartphone is going to end up becoming an embedded chip or an earring or something else soon as the... As the uh, you know, the technology catches up so we can scale this thing down. You'll take it with your annual f flu shot. <laughs> They'll inject it or something. But, uh, you know, carrying the stupid box around and staring at the screen, that's like, uh, uh, the idea that I'm supposed to be typing with two thumbs on a virtual screen that's this big. Look at my thumbs. What do you think? You know, it's like, you know, these are things are so big that I get stuck in my nose. I can't do a 
it's, pff, you know, give me a typewriter keyboard. As long as it's got a typewriter keyboard on it, I'm happy. So I like a laptop, you know, and so on. I use tablets for reading. I think a tablet, you know, like a Kindle Fire, so that's a nice thing to read on. I enjoy it. I can enlarge the text <laughs> so I can see stuff. It's backlit so I can read at night while she's sleeping. You know, there's a lot of this stuff. I am not get a horse. So don't go there. All right. If you think that Bill's anti technology, you're wrong. I'm totally in the midst of this stuff. But what I'm suggesting is the fact that we need to control where the tools are taking us rather than the tools taking us where the tools want us to go, basically, or whoever makes the tools. Because that's what's been happening. Um, as the digital revolution occurred, and then it became the mobile digital revolution. And now, I mean, I was living in California and in the Bay Area, I used to have to watch driving up and down the streets horribly just because of people walking along like this, stepping off of curbs right in front of my car. I mean, I actually had kids on bicycles trying to text, jumping off the curb in front of my car. Ah! You know, kid, you know, ah, bad enough the kid used to wear in the traffic after a ball, you know, now there's not a single one of them that can even see where the ball is because they're staring at the screen. Um, in a study recently, one of the psychologists who I think is probably responsible for terming the latest generation of children the I generation. You know, we had the baby boomers, uh, we had Generation X and you know, Y and whatever. You know, we had, you know, all these different tags we put on different generations. Well, the latest one is the I generation. Why? Because they can't get their face off the iPhone. And that, oh, that's a horrible thing. I would not want to be part of your I generation with that name. Well, that's for sure. Uh, it's very offensive. And some of the studies being done indicate that a lot of these kids are very common. They spend at least two hours a day in front of the screen. But there's a lot of them that are spending eight and more. Okay. And, all right, fine, do what you want to do. But apparently the studies are indicating that these kids are more depressed. They're more emotionally upset. They're more stressed out. They have more uh, suicidal tendencies and so on. Just more psychological problems than uh, previous generations of the same age ever had. And that is pretty clear why. I mean, to an extent, I feel sorry for the kids because, you know, when I was a kid and they wanted to bully you, you know, well, they corny in the bathroom and they punch the crap out of you or something like this, and then you either decided you were going to have to stay out of their way and run or maybe you got back at them, you know, or whatever. But it was a very singular thing in a small group they were messing with you. Now, when they want to punch me out, instead they do it on the internet. And I mean, there's people in Turkey, people in Mongolia, and people in Tierra. They'll flagle. They go, "Why well, that guy's a jerk!" You know, I would not like that. That would not be fun. And I understand why it's so stressful. But the point being here is that when the smartphone came around into our culture, I was amazed at the rapidity that it was accepted by most people and became an integral part of their lives. Now, believe me when I tell you, the guys that made that stuff and when the guys who built the apps that are used on it, they all knew that this technology was highly addictive. They knew that it gave us a dopamine charge when we got a like on Facebook, and that's the same thing that happens to you when you do drugs, okay? And so you develop this addictive cycle, and that's what's happened. This has become an addiction to people. And so basically the machine is driving them rather than us using the machine. It's an inverse, okay? And, you know... We almost never in our society do we ever look at anything that we're doing and, and say, okay, what'll happen when we put this on the street? You know, are there going to be problems? Do we, I mean, people might think this way, but we don't really do anything in a capitalistic society most of the time uh, that, you know, would like look forward to the future and try to shape the situation, do something to try to see that this might work out better for us. Uh -uh, that ain't the way it works. You throw the stuff out there in the street, you make your money on it, and after a couple of years you look at it and go, hey, look at that, there ain't nobody anymore talking to each other and nobody's looking at each other and everybody's stepping off the curb or trying to drive their car down
down the freeway while they're texting. Not too good, but you know, hey, they're so into it, we're going to make a lot of money off you people because you can't even put the thing down. It's become so hardwired into your brain as far as what makes you happy. It's in the happy cycle, okay? Or sad. <laughs> Both ends of the same coin. All right. Uh, it, it, it's tied d deeply into that. What the other things are, well, I can only speculate as to why this technology was so readily adapted. Um, adopted is the word. Uh, I, I believe, yeah. I believe that we're all empty. That's what I see, is that the vast majority of us really, we put up all sorts of different things. We put up, oh, you know, politics, is this is what I am and how would I believe. We put up movements, organizations, we do, um, all we have, you know, you, some of you are going to hate this, but they got religions that gives people meaning in life, you know. Uh, there's a lot of different things that we use that try to, attempt to give us meaning. But the truth is, is not a single one of them because they're externals. They're all external. Will ever give you meaning internally. Okay, You can't do that. You can't reach out into the world, find something, bring it into yourself, and try to fill yourself with it. That's like saying, oh, I can make meaning in my life by buying a brand new Bugatti. You know, or if I have more money, I'd be so happy. You know, it's not real. The happiness comes from the internal. It's a being. It's a centered thing. It's a core issue that you radiate happiness from internally. You don't find it outside and bring it in from the external. Well, in the type of consumer society we live in, we have been trained to believe that the only way you can be happy is if you have a Barbie doll, or if you have a Remington shotgun, or if you have a, Ch a USA in your Chevrolet, you know, Mr. Clean, you know, Mr. Clean, Mr. Clean, what that was a tidy bowl man. That was, he used to scare the heck out of me. Then one of the fists come up out of the toilet. Ah! You know, anyway, if you don't have cornflakes, you're not going to be a happy man. We have been trained to believe that everything that makes us worthwhile comes from out there and we need to go look for it. And that's not true. <laughs> okay, you can't be happy that way. You can only be happy internally and then you can share it. And that makes it bigger in the external world because you can share happiness with another person. That can happen. Um, it's hard when a guy's smiling at you. To, you either want to smile too or you're going to punch him. I got punched a few times because I smile too much. Can you believe that? You know, Don't laugh at me. What do you think's funny? Ah, boom! You know, and I've gotten it before. Uh, I don't think a lot of the stuff that we think is so serious here is really all that serious. So. So here you got this new generation of kids, high generation, terrible psychological problems. Uh, the kids can't get off the darn screens, and their whole life really is focused around this technology. You know, to me, I see it as the gateway drug into the Borg, as in Star Trek. In other words, that smartphone, that is the first human connection to biology and technology where the two have now linked together into a single organism it's a neural net that extends across the entire planet through social media and the internet and so on. So we've created an insect-like communication system that's planetary-wide through this technology where it's ants, you know, they're out around the neighborhood looking for stuff and they come back and they go, hey, I got sugar. Oh, yeah, you got sugar. Where's sugar? It's over there, you know. Well, it's the same thing, you know, it's like tweet. The, the president sits on the toilet at 5 a.m. and he tweets something. Now, ordinarily, I don't tweet at 5 a.m. on the toilet. I usually Brap, you know, but he tweets, and so the uh, you know this this uh, tiny little messages that are really nonsensical most of the time. If you take a look at a tweet and compare it to a personal letter of the mid twentieth century, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> is this communication? It's about as close as two ants going, yeah, sugar's over there, you know. Hey, you see my pug dog? You know, um, he does he does skateboard tricks, and. Uh, that's kind of almost what our communications begun to break down to these days too on top of it but it is generating a total neural net that encompasses the planet connects everybody and connects everybody everywhere they are mobile and it's done with a piece of technology as i said the technology is um it's cumbersome that's it that's one of the worst inventions i've ever run across as far as being uh cantankerous hard to use uh you know, why people like it so much, it really is beyond me, okay? But it's a difficult thing, and it is destined to become implanted. 
We've already started to put microchips in employees so they can get in without the little gate pass on the neck and all that. And, you know, and well, the, the Apple's got its smart watches. Uh, you know, Google tried the glass thing. Uh, it didn't take off yet. It will eventually because I think our technology is going to eventually have to become wearable, if not implantable, and maybe a combination of both is what will happen to us. But the smartphone is the gateway into the um, technological organic human hybrid. Now, you know, if you want to end up like the Borg, give your kid a couple of smartphones and make sure they use them constantly, you know. But one of the things that scares me about it, and, and it's that, well, for starters, for 20 years after the computer was invented by my generation and the internet was up, I had people tell me, oh, Bill, you should have one of these things. I mean, you'll, you'd be just great with it. I know you would. Well, I can find a purpose for it. I mean, I don't follow people like a sheep, all right? I, I, you guys do whatever you do out there, and I don't give a damn what you do, frankly. I really don't. I don't pay too much attention to what other people do and think. It's not my place in life. Um, in general, I haven't been that comfortable with a lot of people's opinions of me. You know, I'm usually referred to as this hairy, scruffy looking guy that seems to know a lot about plants. You know, well, <laughs> that don't impress me much when I hear it. Okay. It's passing judgment. It's value judgments. I've had a lot of them in my life. A lot. And because of it, I don't pay much attention to people's opinions about much of anything, especially not about me and what I should be doing. That right there is a hard line you don't cross. Okay, you cross it. I bite! <laughs> yeah, I do. And so it took me a while to get down to the technology of the computer. It was ever so Yeah, this is great. I'm a computer owner. Well, what do you do with it? Well, I don't know. It sits, I turn it on. I mean, I get an email every once in a while, you know. You, Bah, da, da, da. Well, you know, in my world, it had to have a purpose. I saw it as a tool. It's a tool. And the day I needed that tool, then I went and got it. All right, and that did happen. Uh, I couldn't do stock trading anymore without the Internet. Uh, uh, I couldn't record on celluloid tape anymore for music. It was all digital on hard drives, you know. Uh, 35 millimeter photography and 8 millimeter photography, and uh, forget it, you know, celluloid film. Couldn't do photography anymore. Blah, blah, blah. So, I made the transition. It's been a good one, but it's a tool. When I'm done with this camera, I turn it off and put it away. Do I obsess over it? It's like, oh yeah, it's a camera. <laughs> I can't talk to you in the restaurant over the table because I'm looking at my camera. You know, no, it's not like that. Yeah, every once in a while, I get a little bit like that with a guitar. You know, but you know, it's guitarists call our name. Guitars after women and stuff. You know, it's, Argentinians always said they're shaped the way they are because it reminds shepherds of a woman. So there's a little bit of a connection there, maybe that I obsess a bit over guitars. Past that. A hammer is a hammer, a wrench is a wrench, a computer is a computer, and so is a smartphone, just another dang tool. And there's nothing about it that I find interesting in itself. It's only what it can do. Unfortunately, it seems to me with the smartphone thing, we didn't give much time. It was like the guys who built it knew we were hollow, they, that we needed this, that this would dovetail and interlock with a need that most people had. Unfortunately, the need that I think it fills is a need that is a mistake. In other words, we just don't seem to understand our nature, and that's why we have this need. If we understood our nature, we wouldn't have the need. Obviously, the need isn't universal because I haven't got it. I'm a person. I look at these people with the smartphones, I think they're crazy. That's, that's what I think. Um, it's expensive. Stand in line for the latest iPhone, you know, in the cold in New York, you know, for 48 hours camping out on the side. That's crazy, dude. Okay, the uh, what you pay for the service is very, very costly. Uh, you know, like I say, social media, it's like, give me a beer and somebody across the table I can talk to, you know. And if their phone rings and they want to answer it, I'm taking my beer and I'm going elsewhere because that's rude, Okay. If I'm talking to somebody, 
that conversation is the most important thing that's going on in this world unless the house starts burning or the child's sick, okay? There are emergencies, but otherwise. But, man, in this world today, that phone goes off, and I don't care who I'm with. It's, oh, yeah, the phone, yeah. Phone rules them, okay? It's Pavlov's bell with the dog, and they start salivating, you know. Phone's ringing, phone's ringing, you know. Oh, God, I got, oh, look at that, I got a like on Facebook, you know. Whew, oh, it's sad. So, as I say, someday I will find a reason why I need a smartphone. The world will have moved in such a way that, I don't know, I won't be able to use my credit card or I won't be able to go to the bank or something without this stupid device. So, you know, the day that I have to have it, well, that's another story. Then that's another common tool of society is needed. Um, but as far as liking it or wanting it, I think it's the stupidest thing I've ever seen built by human beings. You know, please take me back to the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk. Give me a machine that looks like something. You know, that thing is ridiculous. I can't even see it, you know. If I inhale hard, I will inhale the damn thing. I'll be only if I can sneeze it back out again. You know, and you drop it, it's busted, and then the guy runs down the sidewalk while you're holding it, and you're blind to the screen, and they grab it, you know, and it's a thousand dollar phone, and he's off. This is ridiculous. Um, what is the most troubling, though, the deepest concern I have, is that the smartphone has begun to replace a lot of basic function that ordinarily had been organic in our lives. For instance, orienteering. Now, not everybody was good at this. Ever. <laughs> okay. There were always people who'd get lost inside of a closet or a paper bag. But, most of us at one time, could kind of make our way around the countryside, either by memory, by direction, by maps, or whatever, you know, and we could get around. Um, myself, I was the sort of person, because I spent a lot of time out in the woods, uh, hike of the wilderness, picking mushrooms, out hunting, um, you know, uh, way out somewhere fishing, or just take plane taking off into a wilderness area uh, with a backpack and going in there for weeks, just because this was an experience in life that was good for me. I liked it a lot. And so I did a lot of it. And while you're out there, there's no road signs, buddy, you know, and there's probably no cell phone signals either. Uh, but there is no way to figure out where you were at unless you could go by the stars, or you could go by where the sun was located, you know. Don't believe that bull about moss on the north side of the tree, all right. Um, you'll be lost for sure if you try that one. But I've always been a person who was able to get myself around this planet. I always knew which way north was. I always knew which way east was, south, west, okay. And if I was going from here to New York, I know I got to go that way, okay. Uh, and I got to go that way probably over 5,000 miles, okay. It's a long distance that way. If I want to go to Tokyo, I go that way, okay. And so on and so forth. And that's instant. I know that. Why? Because in my head there is a map of the planet. And on that planet are little countries, you know. And I know roughly where most of them are. Now, the stuff in Africa changes names all the time. Depends on what revolution. Okay, some of it's hard to track. But, you know, South America's been pretty steady. I can tell you where Argentina's at, Chile, Venezuela, you know, and so on forth. Um, so there's this internal map. And that internal map is part of my brain wiring. And it was wired into my brain by me and my teachers, the people that taught me how to orient there. And it was done by repetition. And so I actually built a neural net that if you tell me that I want you to go to, uh, uh, you know, a particular location in Hilo for a blood test or something like this. All right, well, I automatically know where Hilo is at. So I know in my mental map that I have to go that far. But I'm going to ask what street it's on. And if they tell me, and I know the street, it locks into the map, I pretty much know. And they'll say, well, you know, it's about two blocks down from the old food store. I go, okay, yeah, which one? Island Naturals or the Bayfront, right? Island Natural. all right. So I know exactly where it is in my map. I don't need an English chick's voice on a smartphone, on GPS, to lead me astray and send me over a cliff because there was a detour going on that week. Um, you know, that's it, not required. Now, if I... I didn't know the name of the street, and this happens, then I know I piss people off so much because of this, I'll go, okay, fine, but wait a minute, let me look at the map, and so I'll open up a Google map, and I'll spot it. Once I spot it on that map, it then superimposes over the map that's up here, and I know exactly where I'm going. 
This is what orienteering is, okay? Um, and it's something that a lot of humans were really, really good at. A lot of us were. Um, and the rest of us were, you know, kind of good at it. There was only a small percentage who were an absolute zero and couldn't figure out where they were headed. Well, this is a wiring. Every time you learn something, you learn it and you make it part of the neural net. It becomes automatic and it becomes part of your biology. Okay, well, the same goes for uh, counting change. How many of you guys, I know there's a lot of old gardeners out there. I bet there's old gardeners out there that used to work retail. Maybe you guys even had one of them chrome things on your belt, you know, with the quarters and the nickels and the dimes, you know, and you go, that was, you know, it's $5.42 out of a 10, you know, and so then you'd count the change back, count the bills back out of a roll, and you do all this math in your head. All right. Um, my son, the uh, youngest one, he's 30. He, he was on the edge, right? He's the borderline between calculator world and, and non-calculator world when we did things organically. Um, and because he lived with me uh, a lot of the time, uh, he got trained to do math in his head. All right? And I mean, just general things. You go to the supermarket, you got five items there, you look at them, you know approximately what they were worth, you add the bill up in your head, and you probably come up within 74 cents of whatever it's going to be. So when the cash register rings it up and says, that'll be a thousand dollars and 52 cents, and you go, no dear, it's ten dollars and 52 cents, you know, you <laughs> entered an extra zero somewhere, or two, or three. Uh, oh no, no, computer says so. Oh man, how many times have I heard this, you know? And because I have an entire neural net of wiring, of doing mathematics in my head. And I mean, we're talking in fractions, in decimals, in long division, which is a little harder to do, okay? But multiplication, subtraction, addition, basic math, you know? Even calculation and geometry and angles and stuff, a lot of this, it's in my head. It's part of my brain, and it's been put there by repetition and constant use, you know? And... So, okay, big deal. So Bill says, yeah, yeah, I can do math in his head. And, you know, the kids these days, they can't do it, you know, unless they have a computer or a calculator. I have very few young people have I ever seen today that uh, are not really special savants or something that can even do math in their head. We're losing the ability. It's disappearing because that was one of the first, the pocket calculator. That was long before the smartphone. That started to take this ability away from us because we began to be trained to use the machine. And so the only wiring we had really was how to use the machine and how to read the question. The question said in school, you know, uh, how many ducks are, will fit into a box so big? You know, so you read the question, you put the data into the calculator. You lost the whole net, though, that does the calculation. Now, what I'm saying about this is that, okay, so what, right? When we lose part of the traditional wiring that we have put to our brains because it's not being used anymore, is it filled with new wiring that does something else? Now, this would be the ideal, right? But all I see is people staring at a screen. They're playing Angry Birds, you know, or whatever. I don't see the brains being reprogrammed in different ways that at least for me seem valuable. You know, playing a video game on a smartphone might be kind of fun for you, or watching a movie on the thing on the subway, it might be fun, uh, but it doesn't really train you to do very much, and it definitely doesn't build a neural net like you got when you were doing math in your head. By doing math in the head, we have to learn averages. We also have to learn logic. We learn estimation. Because, you know, I'm not going to look at the cents on every can of soup in the supermarket. I got to know this cans of soup are around a buck and a half, okay? Or two and a half, or whatever they are. But let's say they're a buck and a half. Well, it's probably a dollar fifty-seven on the shelf, right? But I just, it's a buck and a half. So I got four cans. I go to the cash register. Well, a buck and a half, four times. Hey, it's six, right? Well, I know there's going to be a couple pennies off because of that. But this is an estimation. And that way, when the cashier comes up with a thousand dollars, I know they're goofy, all <laughs> right? And so you learn estimation through doing math in your head. You learn logic by doing math in your head, you know. There's a lot of things that are not directly connected to the functions that we develop in our brains 
that affect everything else in our lives. I'm saying that the wiring, the neural net that we build on a lot of the things that we're giving over to the machines today, that those things allowed us to be better people, to understand the world better, to have better judgment about things and so on and so forth. My thought on this is that if I always know where I'm at, okay, and my orienteering actually extends through the solar system out through the galactic core. When I visualize where I am in the mental map in my head, I see our galaxy. And I see where Earth sits in the outside spiral arm of that galaxy. And I know where the core of the galaxy is at. All right? I know where the sun is in relationship to that and what planets are circling it. All right? I don't just know Hilo and the streets. So my orientation sense as a human is um, astrological. Okay? Not that I need it. I don't fly a rocket ship around. I ain't going to visit the galactic core anytime. But I'd like to know the neighborhood. You know? You never know why I'm not going to go for a walk on the spiral arm of the edge of the galaxy here. It just feels right to me to know exactly where I sit in the cosmos. When you know where you're at, you're never lost. When you don't know where you're at, you're always lost. I mean, it's that simple, okay? Um, you know, and, and when you understand the nature, the mathematical nature of the universe around you, and you understand it at a biological level, so that math becomes biology when it turns into brain wiring you have this whole logic circuit of evaluation estimation uh, you know and so on you, you the angle to the sun from here you know is such and such and you know you see the angle of a shadow for instance coming off the backside of a tree and you see what direction it's pointing all right you know immediately that that it's three o'clock in the afternoon because of the angle of that line, like a sundial, okay? Um, you're not lost. You don't question who and what you are or where you are, okay? You lose the emptiness. Okay, I've done previous videos about merging the ancient with the modern. Some of you may have seen these. Um, I think it's incredibly important that things that human beings have done since the beginning of time beating on drums, painting pots, dancing, playing music, you know, uh, planting crops, sowing seeds, fishing, you know, I mean, you name it, all right? The only thing that a lot of us still do anymore, I swear to God, is make babies, you know. The rest of it seems to have kind of fallen by the wayside, especially those of us who live in these big technological skyscraper towers in the middle of New York City, our, our disconnect the disconnect from the historical natural world where the human being has actually always existed and still does exist, by the way. Um, it, 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 we've lost it. We don't have it, and when we don't have it, we're empty because I think if we practice what our ancestors always practiced, we have few questions about who we are, what we are, and where we came from. We're humans. We're great tool builders, all right? Uh, we have tremendous ideas and we're self-aware. And, you know, if you want to be depressed about that, you go right ahead. You know, but I, as far as <laughs> I'm concerned, the reason most of us are depressed and have psychological problems is because of the disconnect. Technologically, we are disconnecting ourselves from the world that was meaningful for us, that actually fed us and gave us our purpose in life. Um, and we're losing the realization that how important that actually is. Yeah, so I mean, I've taken the example of the, of the GPS and orienteering, um, you know, math in the head and the calculator, but there's so many other things, so many other things. Uh, you know, writing in itself and language. Uh, now, here's a great example. I spent most of a lifetime developing a rather large vocabulary trying to understand what all these words actually meant, maybe what their origins were. Okay, I, en I enjoy that part of the dictionary, is where did this word come from? Uh, you know, that's, and so again, we're back to understanding uh, of what we're dealing with, feeling comfortable with it, and kind of knowing the full body of it. Um, you know, and I became pretty good at spelling, uh, so that I very seldom had to go to a dictionary to look up words. But then, as I switched to the word processor and the computer, 
uh, which I had to do. I, I loved my old manual 1940s Underwood. Oh, it was a wonderful ticky 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 ding ticky ticky ding. Uh, I did. I liked it. It was nice. It was like a percussion instrument. The the computers today are nowhere near the fun of that old analog typewriter I used to have, but a lot of value in word processing. And the spell check part of it, of course, hey, I don't have to go run for the dictionary anymore. You know, spell check most of the time comes up with it when I goof it up. Well, right here, the guy spent more than half his life learning how to spell words properly. You know what? I don't care anymore. And the part of my brain that learned all that is deteriorating. The wiring's breaking down. Why? Spell check. <laughs> you know. I, I keep the grammar and all the other stuff turned off. I still make my paragraphs and create my grammar by the old-fashioned way, all right, in my head. But spell check, I'm losing my ability to spell. It's happening. It doesn't matter. I've got spell check. So it doesn't matter, right? But the question is, is that was a big part of what Bill trained himself to do over the years, and I'm seeing the neural net eroding on it. It's getting dusty and breaking down. It don't work well anymore in that area of the brain. And there hasn't been anything new that has shown up to replace that space. I just got a void. Part of my brain's not being used anymore. And this is the argument from my point of view. What is this technology doing to us? Because there will come a day when the machines around us are far smarter and far more capable than we are. Okay, uh, that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, especially when you look at the, the military and the fact that they have and will continue to develop, uh, you know, uh, artificially intelligent weapons of war that will make decisions about killing human beings, all right? This will happen. It's, uh, the technology is already there. How much of it we're actually using when one of these drones makes its own decision, I'm not sure. I'm not in on this. They don't let me know all the secrets. Uh, but whether it's here or it will be here shortly, it's, it's on the way. The machines will eventually have the power and the control and the understanding to be able to remove human beings from the face of the planet at our request. But if Eventually, they will not need our request because as we use it more and more, the machines will have to think autonomously. It's just a natural thing. And so we're going to give machines more and more charge all the time over the world. Now the question is, is this what we want? You see, that's what I'm saying. And when I talk about the technological and organic world, you know, merging them, those of you who have children I really encourage you, bring the children out there in the garden with you. You know, show them how flowers are pollinated by insects. Show them how that spider of there isn't to be feared. The spider eats insects that might feed on your plants, you know. Um, find them some ladybugs or some parasitic wasps or something. Don't be afraid of the mushrooms. <laughs> Teach the children to enjoy. I mean, that's where it started for me. My mother took me in the garden. I was fascinated. I looked at the morning glories, and I realized that the morning glory vine twines counterclockwise. And so as a kid, this didn't seem right. Why go backwards to the clock, right? So I took them, and I turned them around the other way. Well, I went back the next day and met the morning glory vines and taken themselves back off and were trying to go back to counterclockwise again. I fought with them a couple of times, finally gave up, and then just conceded that they want to do what they want to do, and I had to stop messing with them because I didn't understand what they wanted to do. And then I started watching, though, to see, well, do all vines twine counterclockwise? Found out, yeah, <laughs> they do. Uh, vines and tendrils all counterclockwise. It, and I wondered, because of the Coriolis effect, that is, you know, they say that water runs one way down the drain in the northern hemisphere and the other way in the southern. Okay, I was always curious, do vines go clockwise in the southern hemisphere? Well, I'd never been there. I still haven't. One of these days, maybe. But you know, one day, talking to a forester down in New Zealand, um, 
I asked him, I said, hey, you know, would you mind checking something for me? Well, he was obliging, and he was amazed to find out that, yeah, vines in New Zealand, they turn clockwise. At least that's what he told me, so if I can trust this guy, it's a Coriolis effect here with the vines. Well, this all started when I was, you know, this high, man. I was a kid, and I realized that the vines went one way, you know, and Mom would show me all these different things out there. And I connected with the natural world and continued to connect with it and still do yet to this day. Uh, again, being very comfortable with the fact that I am part of it. I know I'm part of it. I feed off of it. Its energy is in me, running through me, and so on and so forth. And so I don't have this disconnect that a lot of people get where they talk about the environment. Oh, you mean my living space? You know, it's, it's, it's what I live in. What do you mean it's an environment like it's something separate? No, no I exist in that. Thank you. Um, well, it's technology stuff. If we let it drive the kids, I don't know. Is that a future we want? The question is that these tools have been unleashed on the society. They're highly addictive. We have a very difficult time controlling them. Honolulu had to put out an ordinance to tell people, no, 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 it's illegal, you can't step off the curb at the crosswalk texting on a cell phone. Because they had so many people doing it, but they were getting run over, because they weren't watching what they were doing. I, I don't know, one of the reasons I've been around this planet this long is that when somebody says, step to the right, I step to the right. Why? Without a question, if the person who said that to me it was a person I trust, and, you know, and one case it was a six-foot diamondback rattler that I almost put my feet down on stepping over the top of a piece of chaparral in the Sonoran Desert and my good buddy Alex who had plenty of snake training in the army said Bill step to the right step to the right being here now is the point I'm still here okay and I'm still here why because I don't know about you guys who think you can text on a cell phone on the freeway or even talk on a phone in the car me I can't and won't even consider that. To me, driving is the most dangerous thing that most of us ever involve ourselves in. You want to die quick, do it on the road. That's the place. Okay, it's the American way of death. And I don't want to die. All right, not yet. Anyway, and so I pay close attention to what goes on around me. That environment is so critical if you want to live a long life on this planet, you know, and keep all your fingers and so on. Um, you know, when it comes to... Uh, uh, the freeway, I, my eyes, I'm a half mile back behind me in the rearview mirror. I'm a half mile ahead of me if I could see that far. If it's a four lane or a six lane, I'm in all lanes with my mind. I'm watching everybody that's around me. Now, I don't trust other drivers much. I myself have never personally had an automobile accident that it was my fault. Okay, I have been involved in accidents when there was absolutely no way to escape the idiocy of other people who weren't paying any attention to what they were doing. And I was trapped. So bang, I get hit because I can't go anywhere, you know. But in most cases where I have an escape route, even though the people that I am escaping from got in the situation because they weren't paying attention to what was going on, I saw their mistake and I'm out of there. And I mean, I'm off the road, out in the snow drifts or any old place just to get out of the way of out of control people on the road. And, and in California, for me, the freeways became unbearable before I left due to the f amount of people on smartphones. I, mean, I watch guys driving down the freeway shaking their arms like this in the air in the car because they're on a dang phone with some guy and they're arguing with him. He is not paying attention to me or anybody else around him. The only reason that guy is still alive is because the rest of us are being careful of him. And I mean, That's pathetic. I don't need the rest of you looking out for me. I mean, if I did blow it and somebody watched out for it, I'm glad you did it, all right? But the fact is you don't need to do it. I'm looking out for number one. That's all there is to it. Uh, every situation in my life is a dangerous situation as far as I'm concerned. And it requires full attention and concentration. So going away from the idea of dying or being injured or something on this order, uh, let's just move towards the basic spiritual belief is that everything that ever happens always happens right here and now. It doesn't happen anywhere else. The tool we call a smartphone, 
I mean, I, I used to walk down the street and I'd see people and I'd wave, you know, or say, hey, hi, hello, or maybe even stop talking to somebody. I mean, it's no joke that these guys are just like this all the time. Yeah, you know, you have to swat it out of their head. You would say, hey, you want to say something? You know, let's talk, you know. It doesn't happen. We're all somewhere else other than where we actually are. We're not within the space and we're not within the time. And everything that happens always happens right now. It, it isn't the destination. It isn't the origin. Life is all about the journey. It's the moment by moment, second by second road that you walk through life. And the, the smartphone has put many of us, so we're not even there. It, it's like flies in the face of some of the most basic spiritual consciousness that we've developed here on earth. You know, <laughs> if, if, if you're wise, you understand that if you're not present within the moment with what's happening, you're not anywhere. Life happens now. Here. <clears throat> the smartphone is an incredible distraction as far as I'm concerned, and it keeps people from focusing on things that might actually be important in their life. Um, again, as I say, there's an emptiness. There was something that was there that the guys that created these tools and apps, they knew that they would make a killing off of you people. Well, you know, it's for the adults. Eh, you know, well, none of us get out of here alive anyway. And what are you saving yourself for anyway? I mean, if, man, if I got another 30 years left on the planet, I'm lucky. So I'm a short timer. No matter much what I do, I guess. But I do worry about the kids. I worry a lot about the kids because um, this is not good for them. And we're accepting it socially in such a way that... The general populace is just embrace this baby like it's a new child, and they're loving it. But the fact is, is that on the legal end of things, we're having to create all kinds of laws about this uh, just to protect people from themselves. Well, that sounds like the kind of laws we wrote about drugs. It's the same, okay? Uh, and it's so much similar. It's an addictive behavior, and it's a behavior that doesn't probably have any good end result. So... I highly recommend you take the children out of the garden and teach them how to connect into the natural organic world. H help the kids understand that they are biological and that them and the environment, the, the kids in nature, it's all one thing. There is no fence up there outside the atmosphere. Everything in the universe that comes this way ends up flowing down through the atmosphere and hits the earth. I mean, they're totally interconnected. The calcium in my bones was once formed in the furnace of a dying star that went supernova. All of the heavy elements here on earth were all created by stars going through their life cycles, creating iron in the core, exploding in a supernova and then dispersing the heavy elements throughout the entire universe and they drift around and they create things like Bill, okay? Um, and understand that we're all part of that. I'll tell you what, that's a heck of a lot more exciting than a smartphone. Oh, dude. I mean, there are some of the heavy elements they have to use to make the phone. And again, we're great tool builders, great tool, yeah, sure. Uh, very convenient tool from my point of view and a highly addictive one. Um, not good for us, frankly. Um, yeah, but I, it depends, you know. A hypodermic syringe yeah, is a great tool when you need a flu shot, maybe. Not such a good tool when you load it up with heroin. Okay, so, you know, let's not blame the tool. It's how we're using it, really, is where it goes. And the fact that we haven't put enough caution against it. Yeah, so how many times have you gone into a restaurant, sat down at a table, and then across the way, there's three people sitting at a table over there, Two of them staring blankly, a third one on a smartphone, hollering at the top of his lungs about something or another. Um, do you remember when we used to go into restaurants and people used to converse with each other? I mean, I agree with a lot of the Japanese restaurants that put cell phone signal jabbers in the restaurants. Because people don't appear to have the, uh, you know, the good judgment. And the culture is getting used to it. And my point of view on it, it's not an advancement at all. It's really important that we put some time down to it because um, if we don't learn to control it ourselves, 
then the control will be forced on us from outside. But I still think that we could end up in an awful situation when we allow the technology to take the advantage over our bi biology. I still think we should be rooted in a biological world as an organic life form that are incredible tool users. As long as that's where we're at, we're good. <laughs> and we're going to continue being good because that's what we've been doing and it's worked out pretty well for quite a while. But the day that you think the tool is driving you to where you can't put the tool down without, oh, I got I to gotta, I gotta do it, you know, that's when it becomes addiction and the tool's driving you. You lost control. And uh, I see a lot of control being lost and a lot of judgment has just disappeared. Uh, people become incredibly stupid when they pick up these instruments a lot of times or rude or whatever. Of course, it's rude from my point of view because I would never stop a conversation with you because the phone rang. Oops, wait a minute. Oh, oh sorry. I got a phone call. Um, I'll be back later. We'll, we'll continue this some other time. Uh, aloha. See ya. Bye.